We are going to go ahead and pick up with our study of the book of First Samuel. We had gone through that for a few weeks and then uh, departed from it. And typically when we go through uh, lengthy books of the Bible, that's what we'll do. Um, I've noticed in, in ministry, it's, it's difficult if you just try to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and, and you don't take any breaks occasionally. It can become almost like a marathon, and I don't want you to show up on a Sunday and say, oh my goodness, are we still in First Samuel? I, I hope that you are enjoying it as we go, and I've just learned that every now and then you need to take a little break and then come back to it. So now let me recap where we are to this point. Um, a man named Elkanah uh, had a wife named Hannah, and uh, they were unable, she was unable to have children. Uh, she prayed that God would give her a son. God gave her a son. They named him Samuel. And she had committed, if you give me a son, I'm giving him back. And so she uh, gave Samuel back to the Lord for perpetual ministry there at the, uh, uh, to Eli the priest. And so when he was a very young man, uh, a, a small child, maybe five or six years old, he was taken to the temple and essentially dropped off to be a servant to Eli the priest, and his family went back home. And uh, he served the Lord there. Of course, his family came and visited him, but that was his, uh, his calling in life was to serve before the Lord. And, and I will say this, just as a, uh, something that affects our own congregation, that was uh, the reasoning for Chad and Amy choosing the name Samuel for their baby because they have given him to the Lord uh, to serve forever. And I just thought that was a really uh, a moving thing, uh, you know, to hear that. So Samuel uh, serves before the Lord. Eli, though, is a wicked man, uh, a very um, uh, unworthy priest, and his sons are even worse. Hophni and Phinehas are their names. Um, there is all kinds of debauchery and, and wickedness going on right there where people are worshiping. And God reveals to the young child, Samuel, that he's going to bring judgment on Eli and Eli's house. And you remember the story where Samuel is this little child, and he's asleep there at the, at the, uh, at the tabernacle, and, and God speaks to him, Samuel, Samuel, and he thinks it's Eli. And he keeps running to Eli saying, why do you keep calling my name? And, and Eli finally is perceptive enough, and he says, Samuel, I think the Lord is speaking to you. So the next time you hear that voice say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And, and God does call out to Samuel yet another time, but in that revelation, God reveals that he's going to bring judgment upon the house of Eli and his sons for their wickedness, and sure enough, that takes place. There was a great battle between the Philistines, the kind of the arch enemy of the Israelites, and in that battle, um, the Israelites, they think, if we can just bring the Ark of the Covenant with us, then God will wipe out the enemies, and they had begun to be very pagan in their thinking, about the ark. They were almost turning the ark of the covenant into an idol, just like their neighboring nations did with their statues and figures of idols. And they thought, we'll bring our idol to the party, to the battle, and, and ours will be able to overcome yours because they knew the history. Uh, they knew about walking around Jericho and the walls falling. They knew about the priest when they carried it and they set foot in the Jordan River that the waters parted and they walked across on dry ground. And so they thought, if we just bring the God box, the Ark of the Covenant, into the battle, we'll win. And of course, they did not win. Uh, the Philistines routed them and took the Ark of the Covenant back with them to their city, and they placed it in the temple of Dagon, who was their deity. They, were, uh, they dwelt by the coast, so uh, fishing and, and uh, nautical life was part of what they did. Uh, Dagon actually looked like a, a merman, I guess. See, he, the statue of Dagon, he would have had a fish torso and tail and an, and an upper man, a man's upper body, and that's what Dagon looked like, I guess, uh, King Triton or something. And, and so... They came in the next day after they had set the Ark of the Covenant in Dagon's temple, and there was the statue of Dagon face down on the ground right before the Ark uh, of God, and it was God's message to them, you shall have no other gods before me, even though these are the Philistines. And they, they chalk it up to coincidence. They, you know, pick, hoist Dagon's statue back up and set it in its place. And the next morning they come in, it's down again, but his hands and his head are broken off of the statue. And uh, they realize, okay, something is, is, is going on here. This isn't just a coincidence. And uh, what helps them realize that is that they are all starting to break out in all kinds of sores and rashes and tumors, and, and, and they're just having this awful... A plague hit them. 
And so they send the ark to another city, and then that city breaks out with tumors and sores, and, and God's just putting his judgment wherever the ark of the covenant goes. And so finally they say, we got to get this thing out of Philistine territory. They put the ark of God on a cart, and they get two cows that have never pulled a cart before, and those cows take the ark of God back to Israelite territory. And that's kind of where our story will pick up today. But before we get into this, I, I want to talk about how do we rightly interpret and apply Old Testament narratives. So if you've ever read, tried to read through the Old Testament, you might have gotten bogged down in the genealogies. A lot of people do. I like those. They're, they're important. But I'm kind of a Bible nerd, and, and most people don't like the genealogy, so-and-so begets so-and-so. It's just kind of like, okay, can we just skip to, you know, some lightning bolts and thunder or something? Uh, but as, as you look at the scriptures, you've got the first five books. Those are the books of, of the law or the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Relatively chronological order from creation until they're ready to take the land of Israel. Then you get the book of Joshua. Okay, Joshua was Moses' assistant. He takes over. And so that's, we're still in chronological order. And, and then uh, the book of Ruth, or the book of Judges, so after Joshua dies, they have a series of judges. Israel would serve the Lord for a while, then they'd start falling away. They would get into idolatry, start worshiping Baal and Asherah, who are the two main Canaanite deities that they continually uh, fell into to worship. And so God would bring maybe one of their enemies, like Moab or Phil the Philistines or some, a, a neighboring country, to oppress them until they realized, hey, uh, or he would, might send a famine upon them or, or some plague until they realized we, we have to, we can't worship these other gods. Often God would send a, del a deliverer like Gideon or Samson. Those are the judges of Israel. So after Joshua and Moses, you have a series of judges. Samuel, where we are, is actually the last in the series of judges before the time of the kings. King Saul being the first king, then David, and so on. So we're kind of in, that's, that, that's where we are. So you have a big chunk of scripture that is Old Testament history, all right? The story really from Exodus till you get through the books of Kings and Chronicles. And then you get into the Psalms and prophets. And so it gets out of order after that because it's really arranged by type of literature, not by chronology. So uh, those books, those history books, if you will, tell us the stories, the narratives of the Old Testament. And so Whenever we read those, we have to be careful that we don't wrongly apply the story to our situation today. Okay, so let's just go over just a, a few things that are, I think are important as we, as we read this story. Um, and I, I inadvertently printed the notes very small, and I apologize for that. So small that I'm having to use reading glasses to read my own. I, I don't know if you have binoculars or not, if you can see that, but that is, that is my fault. Now, remember, first of all, that these, uh, the, these accounts in the Old Testament, these historical accounts, are predominantly descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay? So they're telling us this is what happened. They're not necessarily telling us this is what you should go do. David gets five smooth stones and kills Goliath. You don't get to get five smooth stones and go kill your enemy. Okay? It's descriptive. It's not Prescriptive. Now, there are some portions, like the Ten Commandments, for example, prescriptive. They're telling you, you shall have no other gods. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. All right. So there are, are, there are prescriptive things in the Old Testament, but when we get to the historical books, most of that is going to be descriptive, rather than, not to say we can't draw from a principle. Anyway, be careful about reading your life situation into, a, into this story. Because there's a couple things. One is they are operating under a different set of rules. They're operating under the covenant of the law. The children of Israel had made a deal with God, a covenant with God. So, which not only included the Ten Commandments, God's moral law, but it included all of those other ceremonial laws. And if they followed those the moral law and the ceremonial laws, God would bless them, they would chase their enemies away, their crops would grow, so on and so forth. And if they disobeyed, then curses would happen. And so a lot of times nowadays what happens is people will read the blessings of the Old Testament and they'll try to apply them to modern day things. They'll completely forget about the curses, but, but you have to take the whole package. 
Again, God's character is the same. and you, his, he, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So his character is the same. But the promises made to Israel concerning how they lived under the covenant are not necessarily promises made to you and me today. Uh, there are principles still in place, but the, the promises may or may not apply. Uh, a common thing to do here is to take the Bible hero and say, that's me. I'm David. If I'm going through problems in my life, I'm Job. Anybody ever been Job? I must be Job. I'm so righteous. <laughs> Why would anything bad happen to me? I'm so righteous, right? And we tell the Lord how righteous we are and how we don't think, and, and how could you let these bad things happen to me? But I have far more often been Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, Job's three terrible friends, than I've ever been Job. Because those guys take what's true about God and wrongly apply it to Job's situation. And I've done that a million times. I, I'm far more likely not to be the hero of the story. Okay, so uh, just be careful about that. So, or the enemy or the villain of the story equals my bills, my health problem, my job problem. And that's not to say that there are not some examples to draw on or principles to employ. But the Old Testament is ultimately about God and not you or not me. It's telling us how God dealt with his people. Uh, fourthly, the prophets, priests, kings, judges, and deliverers of the Old Testament, even the very best ones, are very flawed people, indicating to us that we need a better prophet, priest, king, judge, or deliverer. So let's take David as an example. I, I would not want to tell my children, be like David. David made a lot of bad decisions. I would hope my children would not parent the way David parented because he made terrible parenting decisions. He also committed adultery. He also murdered somebody. So D David, even though he was a man after God's own heart, is a very flawed person. So we don't want to lift up the, these characters sometimes. And, and now, are there things that David did right that we should try to employ? Yes, we should learn from those examples. But the hero of the Old Testament is the coming Messiah. That's the hero of the Old Testament. That's the one that the Old Testament is pointing to. Her, and you see this in Luke 24. Luke 24, there's two disciples. Jesus has risen from the dead, and those two disciples are walking away on the way to Emmaus. And Jesus comes to them on the road, and it says he explained to them how everything in the Old Testament was talking about him. It was pointing to Messiah. So please be understanding of that. That's not, again, that's not to say that there aren't moral lessons and things we can learn from the Old Testament, but the ultimate hero in the Old Testament is Jesus. The moral then isn't be like Gideon, be like Moses, be like Samuel, Elijah, or David. Again, not to say that there aren't some things that we can learn from them. But the reality is that Jesus is the ultimate prophet, priest, king, judge, and deliverer. And that's the story of the Old Testament. So now, keeping all that in mind, let's dive in. This is, a very, this is a relatively short chapter. Chapter 7. So the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house. Okay, so the Philistines had just sent it on the cart. And it was in this little town, but even that town was having some problems. So these men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill, consecrated Eleazar, his son, to guard the ark of the Lord. And the ark remained at Kiriath-Jerim a long time, 20 years in all. And during that 20 years, Israel just kept declining. Samuel's a young man when the ark is taken. Maybe five or six years old, maybe seven or eight, we don't know. But he's young. And then 20 years go by, and, and he's growing up as a young man in a time when the culture is just declining. It's on this slow incline into destruction. Finally, it says at the end of verse 2, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. Does, the scripture doesn't tell us what caused this sort of revival to happen. It may have just been that the oppression of their enemies, the Philistines especially, got so bad that people said, we need God's help again. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods, the Ashtoreths, and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. 
So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtoreths, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all of Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. This was a sign of repentance, a, a, a drink offering. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel, who's probably in his 30s now, was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. In other words, they're trying to stamp this out. This is an uprising, this is a rebellion, and the Philistines liked the arrangement that they had. Israelites are probably paying heavy taxes to them. And they don't, want it, they don't want that to change. So the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. And they said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. The people apparently don't feel worthy of praying on their own. They, they want this intercessor to pray for them. Like, Samuel, you're holy. You know, uh, you've kept it clean for 20 years while we were serving idols. So you pray for us. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And he cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. And the Lord answered him. Now, again, do you see that this is descriptive, not prescriptive? If you were going to pray, you don't have to go kill a lamb in your backyard Okay, aren't you glad that this is descriptive and not prescriptive? Okay, it's not telling us what to do, it's telling us what they did. This was a symbol, it, the sin meant there had to be a sacrifice. And so that's the sacrifice that Samuel has offered here. While Samuel was offering the sacrifice, offering the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to the point below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shem and he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. This is not to be confused with the previous Ebenezer that was mentioned in chapters 4 and 5. So this was something that the Israelites did. Whenever God saved them or rescued them or fed them or delivered them, they would build a pile of stones or set up a great stone, and it would be a remembrance. And so someday when their ch child would walk by and say, hey, Dad, what's this stone about? They would say, well, that's the Ebenezer. That's the so stone that tells us that God helped us against the Philistines, and they would tell the story. So it was a tangible reminder that was set up, a visible reminder reminder for something that they could tell their children and grandchildren and future generations this was set up because the Lord helped us in this particular situation. Verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel. And Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year he went on a circuit, from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in those places. And so people could, if they had a dispute, they could bring it to Samuel. He would act as the judge. He would look at the law of Moses and see how it applied to their situation. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and there he also held court for Israel and built an altar there to serve the Lord. So what are the takeaways from this passage this morning as we close? The first is this. Did you catch that it took 20 years? It took 20 years for them to finally say, we have to repent. And there's a couple of things that I get out of that. First of all, I think, oh Lord, please don't let it take 20 years of constant decline for your people to have to say, oh, we, we need the Lord. My guess is that it was probably a slow decline, almost imperceptible at times. 
They didn't even realize that they were slipping down the slope. Until finally one day they looked back and said, look at where we've been and look at where we are. And, oh, it's awful. And some of you have lived long enough to see our own culture go down a slope. Man, I hope it doesn't take 20 years. But the, the other side of that is God is so patient with them. I mean, he could, have, he could have sent firebolts and lightning and everything. I mean, right after the first year, after the first month that they turned away. But God pursues and waits for that repentance to happen. It reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. That father, his son took the money, he went, he wasted it. It probably took some time for that boy to waste the money and end up in the pig pen. No job, really, nothing to do, nothing to eat. He's in a pig pen. And when he comes down the road, who's the first person looking for him? It's almost like the father had gone out every single day and looked at the front porch. Every night before he goes back in at sunset, he just looks down the road just to see if anybody's coming. And, and God here demonstrates astonishing patience. Aren't you glad that God has patience? Man, he's still working on each one of us. Yeah, our justification happens at the cross, but sanctification, that's how God makes us into the image of Jesus, and it takes a long time. And for some of us, it's taken a little longer than others, isn't it? Have you ever looked at your life and you said, ah, oh, I really thought I'd be closer to Jesus by now, to his image, and, but God is patient, and he just keeps working on us and working on us, and he was waiting for Israel to repent, and when they did repent, he was there to deliver them. Secondly, did you notice that the people demonstrated fruits of repentance? They didn't say, oh, we're so bad, we're so, oh, we, we sinned against God. Um, hold on, we've got to go, we've got our Baal service or our Asherah service that we've got to get to also. No, it says they put away those gods. They, there was tangible action that demonstrated that they had repented, that it wasn't just a, oh, I'm sorry. See, the New Testament says there's two types of, of things. There's what the, the New Testament calls worldly sorrow, and worldly sorrow is not repentance. Worldly sorrow is, I got caught. Oh, I got caught, and now I've got to deal with the consequences, and I hate these consequences. And However I can get these consequences to stop, I'll do that, but then I'm going to keep going back and do it. You know, if there's a way that I can keep doing what I was doing and avoid the consequences, that's worldly sorrow. It's not repentance. Repentance says, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against other people. And I'm not going to do that anymore. And I'm going to do, in my part, whatever I can to make it right. In the Old Testament, it was the principle of restitution. If someone had stolen, in order to show that they were repentance, they gave, they, they gave twice the amount back. Remember when Zacchaeus, he had been a swindler as a tax collector? And he said, oh, I, I'm going to, not only am I going to give it back, I'm going to give a lot back. I'm going to give more back than what I took. And, and, and Jesus said, Salvation has come to this house today. In other words, this is real repentance because it's, it, it's demonstrated by a tangible change of heart and a change of action. There was fruit of repentance. True repentance will, will bear fruit. Thirdly, Samuel was the mediator between Israel and God who interceded and offered a sacrifice on their behalf. We have a far better mediator, Jesus, who intercedes for us and offered himself as a permanent sacrifice for our sin. You remember John, when he saw Jesus coming down the road, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sacrifice that Samuel offered, it was for a specific time, but sacrifices had to keep being offered and keep being offered and keep being offered. To the point where in the book of Isaiah, it's, it's fascinating, God says through Isaiah, I'm tired of your sacrifices now. In fact, God says, I'm tired of your services, your, your solemn assemblies, your feast. I'm just sick of it. I don't want any more sacrifices. I want obedience. Stop sinning and then just sacrificing. Sin and sacrifice, sin and sin and sacrifice, sin and sacrifice. They, they were just caught in this cycle. They weren't changing their heart. In fact, God says, Tear your heart and not your garment, because they would, they would tear their garments as a, as a sign that they were sorry for their sins. But then they kept doing the same thing that they just said they were sorry for. And God says, no, rend your heart and not your garment. God had grown weary of all of their sacrifices because their hearts were not changing. 
But the scripture says of Jesus in the book of Hebrews that he goes in to the mercy seat in heaven and once for all time offers his blood, not the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and stuff. But those things were a picture pointing to the sacrifice Jesus would make. But Jesus on the cross offered a once for all sacrifice for sin. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lastly, it's appropriate to establish some remembrances of how the Lord has helped us. Because it brings glory to God and shares our story with the next generation. Now again, this is not a prescriptive passage, it's a descriptive passage. So uh, I'm not telling you to go and and build a stone pillar or, or hoist a big stone up somewhere in your yard. But look for opportunities, Ebenezer's if you will, Look for those opportunities to share how the Lord has helped you to this point because it shares the story to the next generation, to the next generation, that they can look back and say, you know, my grandpa told me about this, this time where the Lord helped. My grandma, uh, my my dad, my mom, they they told me this story and and it's how God answered their prayer and he helped them to this point. You got to share that. Not only share the prayer request, but share how when it got answered. Make sure that there's glory to God given when the prayer gets answered. So, and, and if there's tangible ways and visible ways for, to, to put something there that people can say, hey, what's this about? It might be as simple as this. Maybe, maybe a passage of scripture in a frame on your wall in your house. That when people come in, they say, oh, that's a nice verse. What's that about? Well, let me tell you about this. This was the time when this was going on in my life and I prayed and the Lord helped me through this situation. It's an Ebenezer. It's not a stone in your yard. And again, this is not a prescriptive passage telling you that you have to do this, but it's certainly something that we can learn from. It's a tangible way to share the story that gives God glory to the next generation. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. I pray that you would help us find opportunities to share the story that brings you glory. Lord, I thank you that you are a better mediator. You're a better judge. You're a better priest. You're a better prophet, a better king, a better deliverer than any of the heroes we look at in the Old Testament. Lord, as we read these passages, I pray that you would just draw us to yourself. And I pray that even through the lens of the Old Testament, we would be able to lift you up, that you would draw men to yourself. God, I pray for our nation. Lord, please don't let it take years and years of decline for us to turn to you. Lord, not just for our nation, but for your church, your people who were called by your name. Let us not be comfortable with years of spiritual decline before we would call out to you and beg you for revival. So we pray now that you would send revival upon us. Revive your people first, Lord, that we may be a light in the darkness. Remove the covering from the light so that it can shine brightly. Help us to lay aside the weights and the sins which easily beset us and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.